Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. Benjamin Solomon Carson was born in Detroit, Michigan on September 18, 1951. His life is a remarkable tale of triumph over adversity. How did Ben Carson evolve from a street kid with an uncontrolled temper into one of the world's top neurosurgeons? There were a lot of problems for me realizing my dream of becoming a physician, not the least of which were the fact that my parents got divorced early on. That was devastating. And uh, my mother was one of 24 children. His mom, Sonia Copeland, never made it past the third grade. Born in rural Tennessee, she grew up in a succession of foster homes. We got married when she was 13. To Robert Carson. He was a factory worker at the Cadillac plant and a part-time preacher. And they moved from rural Tennessee to Detroit. And some years later, she discovered he was a bigamist, had another family. You know, she thought it was very strange, and we ended up moving uh, to Boston to live with her older sister and brother-in-law. Uh, typical tenement, large multifamily dwelling, boarded up windows and doors, sirens, gangs, gigantic rats, aggressive roaches. If anybody had foretold a future for Dr. Ben Carson for growing up poor in Detroit's inner city in the 1960s, it may have been as a violent criminal or high school dropout, since by his own admission, he was known as the hothead class dunce. But I remember as a, as a nine-year-old, sitting on the ghetto stairs, looking through the building across the street, out of which all the windows had been broken, and through which a sunbeam was shining. And it made me think about my future. And I remember thinking that it was unlikely that I would live to be more than 25 years of age, because that's what I saw around me. I remember seeing people lying on the street with bullet holes and stab wounds. Both of my older cousins, who we adored, were killed. My mother, in the meantime, was out working two, three jobs at a time, leaving at five in the morning, getting back after midnight. Day after day, one job to the next. She was so thrifty. You know, she would go to the Goodwill and buy a shirt, had a big hole in the elbow, buy two patches and put one on each elbow. People would be saying, where'd you get that shirt? I want one like it. Ben's academic performance worsened. In the fifth grade, I was a student. I was a horrible student. I was the worst student you have ever seen in your life. And, you know, I was called dummy. Everybody called me stupid. I was the butt of every joke about anybody being dumb. And uh, I didn't like it, but I tried to act like it didn't bother me, but it really did. When she realized that Ben and Curtis were wasting their time with constant TV, she literally pulled the plug. Only his mother's intervention stopped him from wasting his life. Because she could only find menial work, Sonia recognized the importance of education. My mother made us start reading books. She insisted that they borrow and read two books a week from the local library. She refused to let her boys go out and play until their homework was done. But uh, despite the fact that no one else believed in me, my mother did. 
you know, we were very poor. There was never money for anything. But it didn't cost anything to get a book from the library. She demanded weekly book reports to monitor her son's progress. She handed them back with notes, even though she was barely literate herself. I was not happy about it. And her friends would say, you can't make boys stay in the house reading books. They'll grow up and they'll hate you. And I would, som I would sometimes hear that. <laughs> I would sometimes overhear her friends and I would say, mother, you know they're right. Despite his chafing at the restrictions, Ben came to realize that he loved to learn. As I started reading those books, as I started reading about people of tremendous accomplishment in all kinds of fields, it became clear to me that the person who has the most to do with what happens to you in life is you. Once I understood that, poverty didn't bother me anymore because I knew it was only temporary. I knew that I had the ability to change my circumstances. This fatherless boy, seethed with a violent temper, led him to physically attack others if angered. A dispute over which radio station to listen to caused Ben to snap. He pulled a knife and nearly stabbed a person. Luckily, a belt buckle stopped Ben's thrusting blade. Shaken by what he had nearly done, Ben ran home and locked himself in the bathroom for three hours with the Bible. He started praying, asking for help with his temper. At Southwestern High School in inner city Detroit, Ben followed his other brother Curtis into the ROTC program. He set a goal for himself of reaching the rank of colonel, the highest available to a student. Ben's adult commanding officer told him that he should apply to West Point, where he'd be offered a full scholarship. Instead, Ben continued to pursue his dream of becoming a doctor. As a youngster, the only thing that really interested me was medicine. I loved anything that had to do with medicine. Anything on radio or television about medicine, I was right there like a magnet. And I even like going to the doctor's office, so that tells you <laughs> that I was kind of a strange person. And going to the hospital was like the best thing in the world because, you know, most people get irritated and they say, my time's important to her. I'm sitting there waiting for these doctors. But I love waiting for the doctors. I would sit out in the hallway and listen to the PA system. Dr. Jones, Dr. Jones to the emergency room. Dr. Johnson to the clinic. They sounded so important. And... Uh, I would be thinking one day they'll be saying, Dr. Carson, Dr. Carson. But of course, now we have beepers, so you still don't get to hear it. But, uh... Despite the downturn in Detroit's auto industry, Ben persisted in finding summer work. Between that money earned and a scholarship, he managed to attend Yale University, where he earned a BA in psychology in 1973. Later, Carson enrolled in the University of Michigan Medical School, drawing on his fascination with the mind to study neurosurgery. In 1975, he married professional violinist Lucinda Candy Rustin, who he met at Yale. After Carson earned his medical degree in 1977, the two of them moved to Baltimore, Maryland, where he became a resident at Johns Hopkins University that year. They went on to have three sons, Royce, Benjamin Jr. and Murray. Carson's skill with a scalpel and his superior visualization ability turned him into a first-rate surgeon. When I decided that I wanted to be a neurosurgeon, well, I wanted to go to the place that's best known for neurosurgery, and that would be Johns Hopkins. By 1982, he was chief resident in neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins. Through hard work, his mother's love and faith, he had fulfilled his dream. In 1983, Carson took a position as a neurosurgeon at Sir Charles Gairdner Hospital in Perth, Australia. In the year he was there, he honed his skills tremendously. He returned to Johns Hopkins in 1984. The next year, at age 33, he became the youngest major division director in the hospital's history as director of pediatric neurosurgery. He also became a co-director of the Johns Hopkins Cardiofacial Center. Using newly developed techniques on September the 4th, 1987, Carson supervised a team of 70 doctors, nurses, and support crew in a 22-hour surgery to separate two seven-month-old twins, Patrick and Benjamin Binder, who were joined at the head. The children survived, although both suffered brain damage. 
But sometimes dreams don't lead to good places, and I'm sure some of you remember the case of the Bijani twins, the 29-year-old Iranian women who were joined at the head. Their lifelong dream was to be separated. They scoured the planet looking for a team that would be willing to take on that kind of risk. Everybody agreed that there was no better than a 50-50 chance of them surviving such an operation. When I was first contacted about their case, you know, I, I told them about Chang and Ng Bunker, the original Siamese twins who lived until they were 63 years old. Uh, but they didn't want to hear about that. And they kept searching until they found a team that was willing to do it in Singapore. And they had actually separated a set of twins from Nepal some years earlier. I was actually involved in that case, so they managed to convince me to come and join them against my better judgment. But I, when I met those young ladies, I was duly impressed. They were full of personality, vivacious, smart, had learned to speak English in only seven months, if you can imagine that. They both had college degrees. They both had law degrees. Only one won at one, but they both had law degrees. <laughs> <laughs> they had a very good impression of the risks that they were undertaking. And they said something to me that really struck me. They said, Doctor, we would rather die than spend another day stuck together. And that seemed kind of harsh to me, but then I did something that I highly recommend to everybody. I put myself in their shoes. I said, what would it be like to be stuck to somebody 24-7? Couldn't get away from them for one second. It could be the person you like the most in the whole world. How long would you like them for? And I began to realize what they were feeling. Well, you know, that uh, operation proceeded. We were in the third day. We were about 90% finished. Some people were starting to celebrate. I was not among them. Because when we got to the very last part of the operation, they started bleeding. Under such pressure, you couldn't stop it. You'd put a clip on it, and it would rupture behind the clip. And another clip, and it would rupture, and it kept rupturing, and they died. So not everything that we do is successful. But interestingly enough, if you look throughout the history of surgery, you find a lot of failure that eventually leads to success. The first kidney transplants, horrible, disastrous. The same thing with heart, lungs, livers, transplanting them, horrendous. You would have said, why did they even bother? But every time there was a failure, information was gathered. Things were learned, and now all of those things can be done quite routinely. In 2001, CNN and Time Magazine named Dr. Ben Carson as one of the nation's 20 foremost physicians and scientists. In his 1992 autobiography, Gifted Hands, the Ben Carson story was published. In short order, he published two more best-selling books, The Big Picture in 2000 and Think Big in 2006. Ben and Candy Carson's books, America the Beautiful, Rediscovering What Made This Nation Great, published in 2002, and 2004's One Nation, both became the number one New York Times best sellers. For more than 20 years, Ben and Candy Carson, through the Carson Scholarship Fund, have awarded $1,000 to students in grades four through 11. Now we, we started right, right here in uh, Baltimore um, with 25 scholarships, one for uh, each county in the state. And uh, you know, the scholarships are given for superior academic performance and demonstration of humanitarian qualities. You, you, you got to care about other people. You can't just be smart. It's regardless of social economic background. 20 to 30 percent of people who enter high school in this country now do not graduate. And this is the information age, the technological age. That wasn't such a bad thing during the agricultural age when we were known as the breadbasket of the world, could produce more corn, wheat, and barley than anybody. Not a problem. Wasn't so bad during the industrial age when we could produce more airplanes and cars and sewing machines than anybody else. 
But we're no longer in the industrial age or the agricultural age. We're in, in the information age where knowledge is power. So we can't afford to have that number of people dropping out of high school. The fund builds and maintains Ben Carson reading rooms for children to cultivate the love of reading that turned Dr. Carson's life around. We all can benefit from more knowledge. You know, I like to challenge people to make a promise to themselves that for the next one year, they're going to spend a half an hour every day learning something new. Just a half an hour. Not much time at all. A lot of people spend that much time on the toilet. Take a book in there <laughs> with you, okay? And learn, and learn during that time, half an hour. Carson was forced to slow down after developing prostate cancer in 2002. He fully recovered from the operation and is now cancer free. In 2006, Dr. Ben Carson received the Spring Arn Medal from the NAACP, the organization's highest award for outstanding achievement. In 2010, Dr. Carson was elected to the National Academy of Sciences Institute of Medicine, considered one of the highest honors in the field of health and medicine. Ben Carson has been granted 67 honorary doctorate degrees and numerous other awards, including the United States Highest Civilian Award, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. I would like to be remembered as a person who helped people to understand the incredible potential that they had and to help people realize that they really don't have to depend on a lot of other people. In February 2013, Dr. Carson spoke at the National Prayer Breakfast where he criticized President Barack Obama for his positions on taxation and health care. You make $10, you put in one. Of course, you got to get rid of the loopholes. But now, now some people say, they say, well, that's not fair because it doesn't hurt the guy who made $10 billion as much as the, the guy who made 10. Where does it say you have to hurt the guy? He just put a billion dollars in the pot. You know, we don't need to hurt him. You know, it's, it's that kind of thinking. It's that kind of thinking that has resulted in 602 banks in the Cayman Islands. That money needs to be back here, building our infrastructure and creating jobs. And we're smart enough, we're smart enough to figure out how to do that. We've already started down the path of solving one of the other big problems, health care. We need to have good health care for everybody. It's the most important thing that a person can have. Money means nothing, titles means nothing when you don't have your health. The following month, he announced that he was retiring from his career as a surgeon and turned his attention to politics. On May 4, 2015, Carson launched his official bid for the Republican presidential nomination at an event in Detroit. He decided to run for President of the United States. I'm Ben Carson, and I'm a candidate for President of the United States. Ben Carson's story is inspirational, not only because of how far he's come, but because his final chapter is yet to be written.